Hi everyone, welcome to week one of motor control and learning. This course is about different theories of motor learning and control and their applications. We will learn about theories that explain important phenomena related to motor learning and control, and learn about how we can use theories to help people to learn to control their motor behavior more efficiently and effectively, mainly doing this in weeks one through six. In weeks 7 through 12, we'll learn about different tests that we can use to see if the way we've applied theory has been successful. Some of the topics that we'll cover in this course include the involvement of the brain. brain has, the brain has different structures and functions, and we can take these into account in when we design contexts that people practice in. We'll look at the role of instructions how much instruction should you give somebody when first learning a motor skill, for example. We'll look at the role of variability in practice. How much variability should you expose somebody in terms of the nature of the task or the environmental variables you expose people to, to in order to optimize learning. We'll look at the role of feedback. How much feedback do you give somebody? Should you give somebody feedback every single time they complete a skill or should you only do it every now and then who should give the feedback and what type of feedback should you should you give people about their performance we'll look at the role of attention where do we put our attention in order to optimize the control of our actions and finally we'll learn about the ways in which we perceive the world when we're moving through it and the implications for this in the design of our practice environments and contexts. The course has is delivered in terms of lectures. These are online only. I'll introduce and explain theories about motor learning and control, talk about some of the evidence underpinning them, and also important applications of each. Also talk about uh, some of the the feedback from students from the previous week, that the nature of this feedback will be primarily coming from your efforts in answering the quiz questions, as well as participating in the, the discussion boards. Any areas where I see that students might be struggling, I'll cover in the following week's lecture. There are laboratories as well for this unit. These are delivered in a uh, mixed fashion. Some are delivered, uh, there, there will be recorded, all, all of these labs will be recorded, the instructions for how to go about doing them will all be recorded online. And there are some that are done live during your timetabled slots, weeks one to six in, in particular, where I'll be meeting with you on uh, Collaborate Ultra to go through some of the tasks that, that I've set for you. Also in weeks 7 through 12, these are intended to be done face-to-face, -face, uh, but this depends on the situation with COVID. In terms of self-efficacy, it's expected you participate in all of the class discussion boards each week, as well as reading the mandatory readings set at the beginning of each week. Make sure to follow the syllabus, lays out all the different tasks that have been assigned for successfully completing this course and when to do so. Work your way through all of the mod modules as well, reading each one, each, each element in each module, and please read all of the assessment files. There are three assessments in this course. There's a take-home assessment item, and there's two of these. Uh, take home, uh, the take-home assignment one is done during the break week. Take-home assignment two, two is done in week 13. Here you'll be answering short answer questions related to scenarios as well as multiple choice questions done behind your, all done behind your computer and during a time-limited period. The sorts of questions you might expect to see will be related to theory and applications all covered in your lecture and laboratory material. The second assessment item is the assignment. There's two parts to this. 
There's a part A where you choose a perception motor skill to learn over weeks one through six. And then there are two meetings, meeting one in week one and meeting two in week six, where we uh, share the perception motor skill that we've that we learn and that we, we will have learned by week six. Part B involves submitting vlogs of your practice for each week and answering case study questions related to your practice for each week. Part A is worth 5%, Part B is worth 25%. The practical assessment is the final piece of assessment. This will be a real-time assessment uh, where I will observe you conducting one of the practical skills skill tests that you will learn in weeks 7 through 11. This is worth 30% to your grade. Uh, I forgot to mention also that the take-home assessments, each of these are worth 20% each. The plan for today, we're going to talk about a theory called information processing. We'll look at some of the evidence underpinning this theory and talk about one of its key applications, deliberate practice. These are the learning outcomes for the lecture, as well as related to the activities that we'll do this week. Please take a moment to read through these and uh, get an at least some idea about what you'll be expected to do. I'll also cover these again at the end of the lecture. Really what I want you to be thinking about during this lecture is these three questions. Firstly, what is a motor skill? How do we define it? The second is, how do you go about measuring a skill? And finally, what's the best way to practice in order to learn as fast as possible or as best as possible? Okay, so let's, let's begin our introduction to the information processing approach. This theoretical framework, it's interesting to, to look at because it underpins a lot of the research that's examined factors influencing performance. The framework helps us answer the question of what a skill is and how to go about measuring it. And it also helps uh, explain why it is that the more we practice a skill, the better we get at it. If we look at this image on the left here, this is a depiction of the theoretical model of information processing. We're going to go through each of these uh, elements in a bit more detail through this lecture. I'll just cover the, the basic elements now uh, to set us up. So the idea is that we have stimulus, a stimulus or information in the environment. This is in some sort of energy such as um, uh, sound waves or ambient light that interacts with uh, a human being. Our humans represented by this black box here. And in order to respond with an action to the stimulus, some sort of processing has to occur before we can generate a movement. And the time that it takes for us to process this information is called the reaction time. In order to process the information, we also need to go through a series of steps, each happening in the correct sequence. The first step is called stimulus identification, and this is where we identify what the stimulus is. The second step is called response selection, where we make a decision about what to do with that information. And the final step involves programming the response. This involves taking what we've decided to do and turning it into information that our muscles, our motor system can understand. And this leads to movement. I always like to capture a theoretical framework in a couple of sentences to get the key take home messages of the framework. Let's go ahead and do this now. Information processing, what it is, it, it's a framework that characterizes motor control as 
requiring that in order to produce a successful action, sensory information in the environment is detected, processed, and transformed into motor information. The transformation process from sensory to motor signals uses some other information stored in memory. And this entire process is limit, limited by factors such as the amount of information processed, the processing, processing speed of our central nervous system, the nature of the sensory information we're dealing with, and so on and so forth. And, and we'll learn about all of these different, many of these different factors during this lecture. I just want to re-emphasize as well that this idea of translating sensor information into motor information, this is, you want to think about this as a process similar to translating two different languages. So imagine you're Chinese and you want to understand French. There needs to be some translation from the French language into the Chinese in order to understand what the Frenchman's saying. This other issue where we use information stored in memory, often you might, you'll come across in your reading that this information stored in memory, it's going to be referred to as representations. So we use representations in our central nervous system in order to perform this transformation step. So in a nuts, nutshell, information processing we can characterize this theory as where performance is characterized as detecting information, selecting the correct action from memory, and executing the selected action using a memory of that action. There are two key concepts we want to understand in order to grapple or fully understand and appreciate the nature of this theory. The first is the computer metaphor. And the second is the chronometric approach. To start with, let's go through the key concepts related to the computer metaphor. The idea is we, we, of using the computer metaphor uh, comes from Fitz and Posner. And they drew an analogy between the way in which humans learn motor skills with the way in which computers construct motor programs. And they argued that the operations of an electronic data processing system is governed by a program or sequence of instructions. Parts of the program may be repeated over and over again. And these short fixed sequences of operations are written as subroutines and are under contr the control of a higher level executive program which provides the overall logic or decision framework that gives the system its flexibility and adaptability. And they argued that in much the same ways, in much the same way, some sequences of movement become fixed units within complex human activity. And these fixed units are quite automatic. They may be incorporated as components into many different activities that we would perform. The timing and ordering of these units will vary with different skills and provide a, the unique character of each activity. Learning skills involves a new integration and ordering of these units, many of which may be transferred entirely as a whole from other activities. So this, this computer metaphor has been used to characterize motor learning and control by Fitz and Posner and also and and in the information processing approach that these these gentlemen helped uh, initiate to go through the main implications of the computer metaphor for the ways in which we characterize and measure skill let's start with the idea that skills can be classified based on their shared characteristics in the computer metaphor it seems that we can we have different skills that that are based on different de definable subroutines. The idea is that skills can be broken down into subcomponents and then studied accordingly. There are different types of skills that, that have been classified because of this. These include discrete movements, these are movements where we have a definitive beginning, 
and an end. A good example might be throwing a dart, kicking a soccer ball. The next type of movement is uh, serial movements. These are movements where you have discrete skills, but there are more than one, and they have to happen in the correct sequence. A good example would be a gymnastics routine. You have a series of actions you want to perform, but they all happen in the correct order. Another example might be playing the piano and so on. The final is continuous movements. These are actions where there's no definitive beginning or end. Examples might be steering a wheel in a car or keeping your bicycle uh, between the, the lanes as you're riding. The next implication of the computer metaphor has been that the context that the skill is learnt in is influences what processes are developed through practice. On the one end, the end of the continuum, we have closed skills, and on the other end, we have open skills. The idea is that with is that with closed skills. We know the environment and the task in advance. So for a javelin thrower, they know where they can stand and the, the region that they can throw in. They also know how they're going to throw the javelin in advance. The only things that might be uncertain could be the wind conditions or there's an audience or maybe fatigue is involved. Because of this, the way you practice the skill is going to be different to how you might practice it if the environment is uncertain. And instead of emphasizing the development of an executive program for making sure the skill is flexible, you don't need to devote necessarily that much time to this. But with open skills, this is definitely the case. You'll need to develop a capability to flexibly use your motor program. So for example, if I want to learn, if I'm playing AFL and I've got the skill of passing the ball in AFL to my teammate, I'm going to be moving, my teammate's going to be moving, there's going to be defensive pressure on both of us. So I need to make sure that my skill is adaptable to deal with this uncertainty. So the key difference between open and closed skills is the degree of unpredictability that the skill has to be performed under. The next idea with the computer metaphor is that we build on top of existing skills and skills can be repurposed for other activities. This has led to the idea that fundamental movement skills, these are the idea is that we have key skills that we develop as children, build the necessary building blocks that lead to specialized movement sequences required for participation in non-organized and organized sport and physical activity in adolescence and adulthood. We have skills such as walking, running, skipping, jumping, throwing. These provide us the building blocks so that we can participate in more complex activities such as team sports, playing, playing soccer, for example. This allows us to participate in sports as adolescents, and as we move into adulthood, we can further specialize these, these skills and repurpose them or build on top of them to become more, uh, to participate as adults in more comp even more complex activities such as professional sport, let's say. The computer metaphor is also used to characterize the differences between beginners and experts. Experts are viewed as having better software, better representations, more accurate representations of their movements, and better hardware. Hardware, sorry. They have more efficient central nervous systems for executing their motor programs. Experts are also viewed as more automatic in the way that they can execute their skills. A simple scenario might be that we 
give an expert a secondary task while they're performing their motor skill. What tends to happen with experts is they're able to perform both of these tasks equally well. And it indicates that the expert is so good with their main skill that they don't need to use cognitive resources to control that skill and they can use those resources to perform the secondary task effectively. This is what it means to be to achieve automaticity. You're able to multitask. Fitz and Posner, in much the same way that we have a series of stages that we go through to process information and produce an action, we also go through a series of stages in order to become skillful or automatic in our ability to execute actions. As a beginner, our, the first stage of learning involves a verbal cognitive stage. The first step is to develop an executive program of the activity. This means we're able to identify the correct task that we need to be attempting to complete, as well as selecting an initial repertoire of subroutines from the ones we already have, for example, our fundamental movement skills, in order to achieve these identified tasks. The next stage is called the associative stage. This is where grossly inappropriate subroutines, wrong sequences of acts and responses to wrong cues are gradually initiated, eliminated. Sorry. Here, the idea would be that is that in the verbal cognitive stage, we might be using a, a whole range of different subroutines to try to address the task that we've identified as important to accomplish. In the associative stage, all the subroutines which don't help us complete that task are, are, are removed and we spend time and start devoting time to the ones that help us achieve our task objectives. The final stage is called the autonomous stage. This is, this is where component processes become increasingly autonomous, less directly subject to cognitive control and less subject to interference from other ongoing activities or environmental distractions. So the autonomous stage is where we're able to execute our motor skill without needing to cognitively try to control this skill consciously. It's able to occur in the background without our conscious, our need to consciously control it so that we can direct our attention to other tasks as well. Okay, so that's the end of the part about the, the role of the computer analogy in information processing. The second key concept to address is what's called the chronometric approach. The chronometric approach is the idea that we can measure the amount of time it takes us to go through the various processing stages involved in information processing. And it does this by using various types of tasks that require different combinations of these processing stages that are implicated in the information processing approach. The first most simple task is called the simple reaction time task. In these tasks, we have an action that, we're going, that we want to perform that we know we're going to perform. And we're going to perform it in response to a stimulus. We're going to try to perform this action as quickly as possible in response to this stimulus. On the left here, we have an example of a, a chap who's going to flex his forearms in response to lights being turned on. And when these lights turn on, the idea is to flex the forearms as quickly as possible. And there's going to be a delay between the moment when the lights turn on and the moment just before the initiation of the movement. And this is, this is called the reaction time. And a nice example of a 
simple reaction time task that we can look at is called the money drop experiment. Let's have a look at this and see how it works in action. We're here at the New York Hall of Science, and today we're going to give Jeff the opportunity to win some cold, hard cash. Let's go. Let's go over some of the key events that's happening here and talk about this example in a bit more detail. In this experiment, the participants are clearly highly motivated. They want to catch this dollar bill. But it seems that despite their best efforts, they're unable to do so. What this gentleman's doing is he's releasing the dollar bill and the participants have been told if they can catch it after he's released it, Catch it and you get to keep the money. To draw a parallel to the simple reaction time task I've described before, the way in which we'd measure reaction time in this case would be the moment that this gentleman starts to release the money to the moment that one of the participants begins to, just before they begin to close their fingers, that time between those two events is called the reaction time. And as we can see, there is some delay between these two events that is impossible to overcome. And it's in simple reaction time tasks, it's about 200 milliseconds. This is this delay is seen to is seen as evidence of information processing that's occurring for an action to be able to be produced. And in the chronometric approach, different situations are compared to make some sort of a judgment about the nature of information processing that's going on based on the differences in the time it takes to do various tasks. So to give an example, we can create a, a little bit more of a complicated situation compared to the simple reaction time task. The way we would do that is we would use a choice reaction time task. In a choice reaction time task, instead of just having a single action that you generate relative to a single stimulus, you have two possible stimulus response alternatives. So the example I'm giving here is of a coach. He's got a ball projection machine and he's launching the ball either to the left, in which case the correct reaction to map onto that stimulus would be to dive to the left. The other option is that he will, he might launch the ball to the right. In this case, the correct action in response to that stimulus would be to, to, to dive to the right. So we have two stimulus response alternatives, twice the number of a single choice, a single reaction time task. And the time it takes to make the correct decision about which way to dive, left or right, in a scenario where the ball might be going either left or right, is takes longer, the reaction time is longer compared to a simple reaction time task. And this implies that additional processing is required in order to make the correct decision in this case. And this is what the chronometric approach, uh, how it, this is how it works. Various manipulations related to different stages of information processing, processing are introduced and any additional time required in order to process and deal with that situation implies that that processing stage has been challenged and it allows us to understand better these their contributions to successful movement. And Sternberg's add, additive factors approach was one of the first techniques to really use the chronometric approach to explore the different 
stages of information processing. They would take a simple reaction time task, obtain the reaction time from that. They would suppose that there is a stimulus identification stage, response selection and response programming stage, and manipulate conditions in order to see if there was an increased reaction time relative to each of those stages. So if we took this simple reaction time task as our base, flexing at the forearms, the, sec the moment we see the stimulus of a light turning on, this might be our control condition. Another condition might be that we degrade the sensory stimuli so that it becomes more difficult to identify the stimuli. It might be that the lights are degraded or flash dimmer. And if there is an increase in the reaction time, which there is in these sorts of cases, this implies that there's an increased processing burden placed on the stimulus identification stage. Another option might be that we require the movement to be more complicated. Instead of flexing at the forearm, you also, in response to the stimulus, would flex the forearm and extend at the elbow. This more complicated action would require additional processing time to program this instruction in terms that the motor system can understand. So the response programming stage would be would have a, an additional processing burden placed on it. And if the reaction time was indeed longer, is indeed longer under this scenario, we would have some support for that idea. There are a number of different terms that come up when talking about the chronometric approach and the information processing approach. So far, we've learned about how reaction time is measured, the time between movement onset, uh, the time between a stimulus onset and movement onset. We'll also hear a term called the movement time. This is the time between movement onset and the end of a movement. And I bring this up now because in order to make a movement more complicated, one of the ways to do this is to require the, the movement that we will do in response to a stimulus is to make it is to require it to take longer. Now that we know what we know about the information processing approach, where it comes from, and its key techniques for understanding different pro information processing stages using reaction time measurements and various conditions to see how there are, these stages might be affected by various factors. Let's have a, take some time, five to 10 minutes to reflect on this question. How can we use the information processing approach to characterize or answer the question of what is motor skill? I'll see you all in five to 10 minutes for the next part of the lecture.